I picked up a couple things from the Methodist Church. It came back later in my life. Uh, one that uh, at that time they taught that Jesus Christ was coming back. And, uh, but one of the things they teach is that you've you, you got to keep yourself saved. You don't have eternal security. So that will come to play in my testimony here. Uh, so at age 13, I, I, I was given the choice whether to go or not, and I quit. Uh, last thing I did with the, the youth group uh, was bowling. I was bowling with these guys, and a bunch of my hippie friends came in. That was in the 70s. Uh, and they teased me about being with these sissy Christians. And at that time, I thought, yeah, you know what? Because the Methodist church then was effeminate. Yeah, that's right. uh, it was just the women were running it. And you know, shortly thereafter, within 10 years or so, that church had a woman pastor. So. And there it goes. It just proves Dr. Ruckman what he has always said, that uh, you know, it starts with a man, a movement, a monument, yeah, that's right. materialism, then becomes apostate. You know? And that's what the Methodist church, Luther, and all those have done. So I quit going to church, and I wanted to go have fun, what I thought was fun. I didn't know what the Bible said about that there's pleasure in sin for a season. I didn't know that there's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. You know, I didn't know what Jesus Christ said in John chapter 8 when he said, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. I thought I just wanted to go have fun. Now, I like my testimony because I got saved. It's my testimony. I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm glad that God saves old sinners. Amen? Amen. Uh, I like my children's testimony. Mm -hmm. I like Nate Gipps' testimony and David Habman, some young men I met in Pensacola when I was in my third year of Bible Institute. They were 18. I was 37, I think. I was the old man. And as Nate Gipp likes to keep telling, he tells me, and you're still the old man. You know? But uh, anyway... Um, I like that, you know, the best thing to do is get saved at a young age, get in the Word of God, get in church, love the Lord, and do something for Him. You don't have to get spotted by the filth of this world. You don't have to get in the garbage, you know, that it stinks. You don't have to taste it. But I'm glad I got saved later on. But, I, you know, then I did, I went, I spent 17 years of getting messed up by drugs and alcohol and just my life being ruined. And, uh, but then, you know, uh, there was one day, Desert Storm was starting, 1990, and I remember looking at the news, and, you know, Saddam Hussein was shooting off his rockets at Israel, and I, and I remember thinking, man, you know, this is like biblical stuff. This is where it all started. You know, I didn't get messed up by the world's teaching that they, you know, like now they try to teach you that civilization started in Africa, uh -huh. which yeah. is, that's a lie. That's right. Started in Mesopotamia and the Fertile Crescent in there, and and uh, but I knew that that's where it started. And I remember thinking, "Wow, you know, Jesus Christ is coming back, wow. and if He's coming back, I'm going to I'm going to hell." Wow. And because uh, you know, again, I was taught you had to keep yourself saved. If you and I don't even remember being saved for one. I don't remember that. And I, so I got this idea. I thought, well, I, you know, I got to be really good when Jesus Christ comes back, and. Uh, I don't know that I can be good for that long, maybe a, two weeks. <laughs> so uh, I got a Bible, and I started reading Revelation. And I was thinking, I'm going to try to figure out when Jesus Christ is coming back. And then maybe I can get good enough, and I might make it. So I, I, got, I had my beer, my cigarettes, and a Bible, and then there was a knock on the door. And uh, a man named Bill Dunleavy didn't know what I was doing. But God did. Wow. And Bill Dunleavy, he'd gotten saved. I, I ran with him. You know, a small town, 2,800 people. Everybody knew everybody. Went to high school with him. Worked at the penitentiary with him. All sorts of different stuff. Partied with him. I remember when Bill Dunleavy got saved. Because he, he had a scripture sign in his yard. <laughs> and uh, my friends and I, we used to sit in the bar. And we'd kind of like, oh yeah, Bill, he, he thinks he found God. Ha <laughs> ha. He probably played Black Sabbath backwards and thought he saw God. Some of you might get that. Some might. If you don't get it, that's all right. But I knew there was a difference there. And uh, so Bill Dunleavy knocked on my door. He'd been praying for me. And uh, he saw the beer, the cigarettes, and the Bible. And he said, asked me what I was doing. I told him. He, and he kind of laughed. He goes, well, you can't figure that out. And I said, why is that? And yeah, you're right, because I, I, can't, I can't seem to figure it out. He said, well, for one, 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, for they are spiritually discerned. He said, you can't understand that till you get born again, till you get saved, and the Holy Spirit can start 
to teach you. Amen. And he goes, besides that, you know, Jesus said that no man knoweth the day nor the hour. Mm -hmm. And then he said, but you're right, Jesus Christ is coming back, but then there's going to be the rapture mm -hmm. and the church, the blessed hope. Mm -hmm. And I said, Bill, well, you know, when that happens and you're gone, then I'll believe. And then Bill Dunlevy took me to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, ah. where the scripture indicates that because there are those that had pleasure in unrighteousness yeah. and received not the love of the truth, God himself shall send strong delusion that they might believe a lie. And I'm just like, ugh. Because <laughs> the truth is, you know, it's like, I, I remember even before I got, I didn't get saved then. But I finally, I did get to church. But even then, it's like, the thoughts are, what are my friends going to think? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? And, but the friends that weren't doing me any good. <laughs> and you, but you hold on to those things. And you get worried. Man, I had... That's why when I read Isaiah 42, 16, after I got saved, I got saved in a small church, Tushi, Washington, a town of about two, 300 people. Uh, David Bosley was the pastor at that time, and I went down there and got saved. And you know, I, had, I had no idea. And I started reading the Bible, and I read this verse. I know doctrinally it's applicable for, for the, uh, the Jewish people coming out of the Great Tribulation. They're, they're gonna be, their eyes are going to be opened. They're going to be led in a way they knew not. Darkness is going to be light before them, and uh, they're not going to be forsaken. But I took that verse, and I, I read that, and I said, that's me. Uh -huh. And I'll bring the blind by a way they knew not. Amen, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3 and 4 says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. I kind of butchered that up. i got to go over it again. Amen. <laughs> But anyway, yeah, and I'll bring the blind by a way they knew not. I will lead them in paths they have not known. I, and so that's when the journey started. Even then, though, I didn't, you know, I got saved, and they told me about eternal security, and I, I grabbed it. I said, okay, now leave me alone. <laughs> and I, I spent a year getting messed up. I, I actually became a seven-day Adventist. Wow. The, I met a girl at a bar at a dance. <laughs> that's how messed up. I didn't get into church. Nobody followed up on me. Bill Dunleavy went to PBI, which I'm glad. Uh, and I met this girl, and she, she was Seventh-day Adventist, and she took me to, uh, she cut, talked me into going to a Revelation seminar, and they give you a guided tour Aww. through the Bible, you know. I, I know their line, you know, Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandments, and well, the Sabbath is one of his commandments, so if you love Jesus, you keep his commandments. Just like, oh. Now, see, she worked Saturdays, <laughs> but she could, she was a nurse. I asked her, how come you can work on Saturdays, and I can't. She goes, well, I'm a nurse, and Jesus healed on the Sabbath. Oh. I was, I was, at that time, I was delivering produce. I worked in a produce warehouse. I said, well, he fed them on the Sabbath. <laughs> so I should be able to work. Oh. Anyway, we were, I got baptized in a seven-day Adventist church. I thought I found the truth. Mm. Uh, I was getting ready. I was, gonna be, I was looking into going to a seven-day Adventist college, a theological wow. college. And then Bill Dunlevy called from PBI. And he, he asked me what I was doing. I told him, and I, I said, I think I found the truth here. And he, and he goes, well, he just took me to a couple places, but the thing that stood out is Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Yeah. Let no man therefore judge in respect to meat or drink or the new moon or the holy days or the Sabbath days, right. which are a shadow of things to come. But the Amen. body is of Christ. Yeah. Praise God. It's going to happen again. I don't know why. The millennial kingdom, I don't know why the sacrifices and all that starts again. I understand in the Old Testament, it's a picture of Jesus Christ coming. Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. You know, he's the Lamb. That's all a picture of him coming, and it's not perfect. They have to do it all the time. One time here, Jesus Christ, praise God. So anyway, our relationship ended, praise God, and then I went back to the bar. I was confused, and then finally I, went, I ended up going back to church out there, and... and uh, but even then, I spent like a month. I was going to Seventh Day Adventist on Saturday. And I wanted the truth. Mm -hmm. I wanted. I said, "Lord, show me what's true." Mm -hmm. And I was going to Sunday school on Sunday, Tushi. Mm -hmm. And it's a Seventh Day Adventist thing. It was all Levitical law, dietary stuff. Don't eat this. Don't touch that. Da 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 da. Mm -hmm. I just ugh. Mm -hmm. and, but in Sunday school, he was in Genesis chapter six when I got in on there and found out how that ark was a type of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And how God, you go in there, God's in there, you get in there, God shuts the door. And that door don't open until he says, come up here. So anyway, I, I got into church. I went, when, I, when I went back the first time after being gone a year, the, the preacher, he preached on the prodigal son. And I just said, okay, God, you got my number. And uh, 
I'm going to be in church whenever I can. Amen. Whenever those doors are open, I'll be there, and I'm going to get in the Word of God. And that's what cleaned me up. I'll bring the blind by a way they knew not. I'll lead them in paths they have not known. I had no idea where I was going, but it was far better than where I'd been. Amen. You know? And then you know, I'd made that. I told God, I said, whenever the doors are open, if I can be there, I'm going to be there. And I, I've done that throughout my life, our marriage life. You know, if there's a meeting we can go to, I, I'd love to be here for your blowout, but you probably don't have room. So and I, I'm going to be up in Idaho at that time, and I got doctor's appointments and stuff and that I need to take care of, but you're going to have a great meeting. So it then uh, this goes with the football. Then the pastor decided to have a Monday night Bible study, men's Bible study. And I was like, golly. Come on, God. I gave up football Sunday morning. Now you want me to give up Monday night football? And I just, okay. And I was a 49er fan back then. When oh. Joe Montana, I think that was the best 49er team. But anyway, doesn't matter. So I, I just, you know, now I, don't, I could care less. Amen. I could care less, man. I'm not, I don't want to give them the time, the money, the any of that. I'll, you know, praise God. And then in 96, I went to uh, Pensacola Bible Institute in, in April and uh, went there, but I didn't start till September, but I met Anna and then we got married in August and PBI was our honeymoon. So there you go, man. The funny thing is, is I could say this here in this church, cause, um, but uh, I'd been praying for Anna. See, Bill Dunleavy, he'd he left PBI, then he went back. I'll just tell you that. He finished, praise God. He left partly because he thought the rapture was going to be happening any time, 1995, 96. So. But he, he was instrumental in me getting back there. But uh, he, he asked me to pray for this young lady named Anna, and she was, having a, she was going to court, taken to court by her former husband, who was trying to take custody of her daughter. And... Uh, they, you know, they, this is part of the, what they painted. They tried to paint her as being an occult, Pensacola Bible Institute. Oh, wow. And that, you know, Anna, she'd go around with her hair in a bun, which she'd never done. But she'd have her hair in a bun and a, a Bible in one hand and a wooden spoon in the other. And that she was supposedly beating her child, which she wasn't doing. And so I'd been praying for her. And Bill Dunleavy was mentioned. And he's saying, hey, pray for this guy, Greg Stedman up in Washington. He needs to come down here and go to Bible Institute. So when we met, we found out later that we'd been praying for each other. So that was a blessing. Wow, yeah. In Anna's court case, just to tell you this, how God works things out, we don't know if the judge was saved or if he just knew the Bible. But when he made his uh, rendering in Pennsylvania, he said, uh, I don't claim to have the wisdom of Solomon, but I'm not going to split this child up, divide this child. So, and that's God, you know. And, uh, so went to Bible Institute, got out of Bible Institute, uh, Ended up in Post Falls, Idaho, Heritage Baptist Church. One of the things that happened in Bible Institute, this goes with how I ended up on the mission field. <clears throat> Brother Donovan in missions class, he mentioned going to the Philippines and teaching and preaching and, and how uh, I have to 125. And uh, yes, sir. Yeah, my wife's keeping track of me, too. <laughs> Sorry, we don't have to lock. No, 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 that's all right. And uh, he, Brother Donovan mentioned how the Filipinos were just hungry for the Word of God. Uh -huh how they would go late into the hours on hard plastic chairs, just like kind of like what you got here, but not quite that good. These are nicer. Uh, but he had to tie handkerchiefs around his wrist to keep the sweat off his notes and his Bibles. And I remember in 1997, whatever, thinking, Lord, I'd like to do that sometime. And I forgot all about it. Ended up in Post Falls, Idaho, uh, helping Pastor Tim Habman. I forgot all about that. Went to Tim Habman's church through a course of events uh, where my son, John, when he was born, he had, he had to be f flown to Spokane, Washington, which is by Post Falls, Idaho, and he had to go into the neonatal intensive care because he was a premature baby. He had troubles breathing, although he was, what, 12 pounds? 12 pounds. And there's another story. I ain't got time to go into all that. It was something the doctor did that was messed up anyway. Um, so he flew, they flew him to Spokane, Washington, and I went there, and I had to wait because she had the C-section, and uh, I knew Tim Habman was in Post Falls, which is close to Spokane, so that's where I went to church. Mm -hmm. And we spent time in the Ronald McDonald House a number of weeks, and uh, there was one time when I went back to work, Anna stayed there, 
looked like John, John was ready to get out, and then she became sick. And uh, the, she ended up going to the ER and finding out she had a pulmonary embolism. So they put her on the one floor. She was on, to, back in the hospital. John was on one floor, and I went back to Spokane. But at that time, I got to know Tim Habman, and then the Lord directed us, and we ended up becoming members there in 2002, and we're still members of that church. Mm-hmm. And uh, in 2013, I went and visited Bob Chris, missionary to the Philippines. Mm-hmm. And the Lord just showed me that. He'd have me go to the Philippines as a missionary, pray about with my pastor. And uh, then God just showed me uh, one thing in, in particular, and then we'll get to the video shortly. Amen. It is good stuff. Yeah. Um, I was praying because, you know, I'm getting ready. Here I am at 54, going to the mission field, going to be selling my house, uprooting my teenagers. I had four teenagers at that time. Rachel, my stepdaughter, she was, uh, what was she, 21 now? 23, yeah. So she didn't have to go. Uh, <laughs> anyway, and uh, I'm wanting to be sure. I'm wanting to be sure that this is what God would have me to do. And I had a reoccurring thought. Turn to Acts chapter 10 to get some more scripture in here. Acts chapter 10. I had a reoccurring thought. I was like, Lord, I want to go. I want to go, but I, I, I don't want to be doubting nothing. I don't want to doubt nothing about this. Or, and I thought, I think that's in the Bible. But is it doubting nothing or nothing doubting? So I looked it up, and what it comes to be is that it's both. In Acts chapter 10, in verse 20, Peter is told to go with these men that Cornelius sent. Arise, therefore, and get thee down, and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. In Acts chapter 11, verse 12, Peter rehearses the matter. He says, and the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. And that's what I want. I said, Lord, I want to go doubting nothing, nothing doubting. No, I wanted to respond to the call, doubting nothing, and I want to, conti- I want to continue in the call, nothing doubting. That's good. And uh, so I was praying that. I was working out of Portland at that time, and that was, you know, about 2013, 2012. And uh, I decided, uh, my pastor had said, well, if you're in that area, you should go to Bethel Baptist Church, Salem, Oregon and visit that church. A friend of his was pastoring there. They just, they'd probably be a blessing. And that morning when I'm praying this, I want to go. I want to know if you, God, I want you to show me. And the uh, Lord put it on my heart to go to that church. And I went to that church, and you know, it was a great t- Sunday school. Uh, and right before the offering, the pastor gets up there and he says, I'm going to do something I've never done before. The pastor goes, I'm going to show slides before the offering. Not to get you, his congregation, to give to missions, but to show his congregation, because they had been faithful to giving to missions, that they were able to help out some Christians on Mindanao in the Philippines at a refugee camp who had been displaced by Filipino Muslims. And the first slide he showed was of the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, one of the radical Philippine Muslim groups there. And they were lined up in ranks and the, the, you know, had guns. That didn't bother me, but what got me was the countenance of their face, the anger, the hatred. And the Lord said, you know, that's Genesis 16, 12. He is a wild man. That's the fruit of Ishmael. That's that religion. He's a wild man, his hand against his brother, and every man's hand against him. And it broke my heart because all my, I have cousins that are half Filipino. I've been in the Navy myself. I had 16 years in the Navy, 12 with dad and four on my own, okay? <laughs> 79 to 83, I went to the Philippines. I was lost. But then even on, that, on, the, on the trip when I went to visit Bob Chris, uh, uh, they were always very gracious and loving. They still, for the most part, have, a, have an appreciation for Americans. And uh, so the difference there in seeing the Filipino Muslims and compared to the re- Filipinos, I just, it broke my heart. And I just like, Lord, if I can somehow go to the Philippines and uh, Amen, preach, Amen. teach, help uh, teach Filipino young men and young ladies, and reach some Muslims, I, I, I'll go. Mm-hmm. And the Lord opened that door. Uh, my, my two older boys, who at that time were what, 16 and 17? Yeah, that's a good guess. Uh, Caleb and Andrew. And, uh, you know, they had it figured out when I first said, I think God's calling me to the Philippines. They thought, well, they, they knew how this Baptist missions thing went. And, you know, Dad will have to, you know, it'll be about three or four years before Dad gets on the mission field. And by then they'll be of age and they won't have to go. <laughs> 
That's, they actually told me about that they had that conversation. I'm not just making it up. They actually figured that out. And then my pastor decided to do something different. Uh, we'd been growing sufficiently enough to where he was thinking of getting an assistant pastor, seeing if the church could support that. He put that on the back burner, and there, it was there to support a, a assistant pastor. And he put that on the back burner, and my church sent us to go on a survey trip as a family. And we would pastor, my pastor said, look, you'll, we'll go over there, maybe two, maybe three months, we'll see as God provides. Mm -hmm. And we went over and worked with Brother Gerald Sutek, mm -hmm. and we were there for seven months. Mm -hmm. And God confirmed it. We came back in 2015, put the house up for sale, and then went on deputation for 17 months. 2016, we ended up back in the Philippines, worked with Brother Sutek. Uh, when we were there with him, he was renting one building for the Bible Institute and the church, his, his, his house. Uh, the Filipino pastor's place, and then they just started renting a place for a, a Christian school, ACE. Mm -hmm. And so he had this idea where he was going to try to get property and just have everything in one spot, and he was able to do that. So we got there on the ground floor of that and got to, to be a part of that. And now you're going to see this video where it will tell you about what we've been able to do there Amen. and give you some testimony of some Filipinos that graduated from the Institute and some of the fruit there. When we go back, you know, there's another American working with him now. When we go back, uh, my wife and I are going to be going to another area on the other side of Cagandero. Cagandero is about a million people. And we're going on the other side of a place called Claveria. Uh, it seems like God has opened the door there and going to start a new work. So uh, this is the, the video, and uh, it'll be a blessing to you. And we'll go from there. Go ahead. Hopefully it'll work now. <laughs> Prince of the power of the air. <laughs> My dad loves, good afternoon, good day. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to look at this brief video. We'll have some testimony from some of the people that have been involved with this ministry, some Filipinos and some Filipinas. You know, I am standing here. Right on the outskirts of Lumbia, you'll see a division down there, subdivision down there, Westgate, and then the church is over there, over by where those mountains are, towards those mountains. You know, the Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 10 through 12 says, I am my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. Then he desires that you would learn doctrine and learn how to reach others with the truth of the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Come, my beloved, let us go forth into the field. Let us lodge in the villages. Let us get up early to the vineyards. Let us see if the vine flourishes. We've been able to do that here with Brother Sutek. This is a road, a back road to Lumbia. Brother Sutek took me on this road in 2014 and it was not paved. They have just finished it. And we, we came out here on the back road to, to go to the police station. And at that time, we had no idea that we would have our church out here, the Bible Institute, and that we would have various ministries out here and still reaching Kagiyan Doro. Thank you for your time. I hope you enjoy the rest of this video. We are here at I Believers Baptist Church. We have been here since 2016. And this is, of course, as you know, 2020, uh, a year that is going to go down in history <laughs> as a uh, one where you really couldn't make any plans because everything changed. I'm thankful for the certainty of the words of truth. You know, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 22, verse 20 and 21, Have not I written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge, that I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth, that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. We've got to see God do a lot of things here. As you'll see, the, the church that was here, that's been built. We've had various ministries that we've been able to do. And of course, like you in the States, we've been had to dial back significantly because of uh, this COVID-19, this flu bug. And we've still been able to do some, but we've been slowed down. But maybe it's a good time to slow down and reflect and think and, and just acknowledge the mighty works that God has done. Now, what God put on my heart was to, to be able to come here and, and teach and instruct and, uh, and have a church, see people get saved and, and 
help Filipinos and Filipinas to, to understand and get a good handle of the Word of God. That they know that they have the certainty of the words of truth. That they can give an answer to every man that asketh them of the hope that lies within them. We've been able to do that and see that in the various ministries at, uh, at the police station, at Sepalco, the electric company, where they let us have Bible study on Saturdays with these students that get help. Students from the age of 6 to 18. Amen. Students that are in school, they let us have an hour or so teaching them the Bible. We've seen some growth there. I could tell you a night who went to to go start a church. And he just employs and does the same things that we have done here. That we have done in, in having public ministry, in the police station, the schools, the high school, and wherever we can get into the hospitals and learning to minister. And now one of our graduates is able to preach in that radio station and Amen. send a message into Morawi, a city that was besieged by terrorists, and now Giovanni is able to preach on that radio station. Praise the Lord. The certainty of the words of truth in that area on the radio station. Then we have Joshua, who's up in Paranaki at Bible Leaders Baptist Church up there, and be able to preach on another radio station that Gene Sharp has had a part in, in faith for the Philippines, and Howard Hunter have had a part in putting in these radio stations. You've got Mike Wood, he came here and went to the Bible Institute. What has a heart, a missionary's heart, and found out about this uh, through Pastor Mike Beach, and then came here and saw the work and decided, if I'm going to want to be a missionary, why not go to the for a mission field? We've handed out a million tracts here in the last five years, six okay. years, wow. and a lot of the most of chick tracts. And yeah. it's, uh, you know, chick tracts get read. It's been said that if a chick track will be read over by different individuals multiple times. So you'd think that everybody would have heard of us, but it's still amazing when I talk to somebody and they have not heard about the Leaders Baptist Church. So, you know, we still continue because there's lots of people that haven't heard the truth and we want to get them to them. But keep those ministries in prayer, please. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Now we're going to introduce you to some students and some graduates have different works. You'll get to hear from Alvin and May, who will be going to another area to reach out to the, some tribal people out there in Kalinaum. You'll hear from Jessa B, who is a, a fruit of the ministry of Sapalco, who's now in the Bible Institute here. And you'll hear from Clint, who was at the orphanage of Boys Town. And you get to hear his testimony, how he ended up coming here to the Bible Institute. A wonderful day to all. I'm Alvin Jacques Malco, a servant of God. To our fellow faithful brethren in America and all over the world, grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank the Lord for giving us a wonderful opportunity to stand and testify as one of his soldiers, to the saved and also to the lost. It's a blessing that God counted us in giving us such a privilege to minister to the indigenous people here in Mindanao. You might wonder where I started. Well, somebody just invested her time in extension classes and everything follows. But I get lost, blame God for everything that happened when my dad died. But now, praise the Lord, I'm back to my first love. And right now I'm working as one of the teachers here at the APE school. And we do have some other ministries also. But we're really, really more excited to put back in ministry. You might wonder where I started. Well, I grew up where Muslims are all in our area. And at that, that time, I wanted want to go in a rebels, Muslim rebels, praise the Lord, that happened. And then uh, I started to go in another, uh, some addicted to drugs, liquors, and all devices. But I once was lost, but now I found. Until I personally knew God, I got saved, and everything follows. He opened this mountain ministry to me and after I graduated from the IPMP under the leadership of Dr. Gerald Sutet. Right now, me and my fiancé are preparing for this work. Uh, there are more than 200 children and 100 adults to minister. And we're very much excited for what God will open next. Remember that God can still use anybody only with a willing heart. 
Please include us in your prayer and the ministry. To God be all the praise and glory of the good day song. Hi, my name is Stephanie Valiathan and I am one of the students of the Institute of Biblical Ministries here in the Philippines. Before I came here, I was a scholar from Sepalco, where Pastor Greg and his family was ministering. I was raised a Roman Catholic, and I grew up with the thought that as long as I do good, I'm okay. I didn't know about the Bible, nor did I know about Jesus Christ. But with the help of Pastor Greg and his family, I got to learn about the Bible and the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And last April 29-17, I got saved and I started going to church. When I was preparing for college, I was to take up engineering, but somebody asked me, why not go to Bible school? So I had prayed for it. My mother never allowed me. So I told God that if it is His will, He will provide a way for me. And so He did, and here I am. It's been a year already, and I knew my mother got saved, and my two sisters got saved. Hi, today I'm friends. I'm a Bible student at the Institute of Biblical Ministries in the Philippines. Before I got saved, I was drug addict, alcoholic, and I smoked. Until 2016, I surrendered to barangay officials because they were chasing me. And I was brought to police station. After three days, I was an inmate to the Hanan Kabataan, a minor agent prison. After a year, my case was dismissed. Then they transferred me to Boys Town. In the Boys Town, I heard the word of God that was fish. And a month later, they invited me to go to church. One day, Pastor James visited me, Boys Town, and my friend, and I were given a Bible. And last in the eating, I got saved. I was a grade 12 student, but I purposely stopped and decided to attend Bible school because I feared the word of God. Psalm 105 Psalm 105 verse 1 through 5 Give thanks unto the Lord Call upon His name Make known His deeds among the people Sing unto Him Sing psalms unto Him Talk ye of all His wondrous works Glory ye in His holy name Let the heart of them that rejoice it Seek the Lord Seek the Lord and his strength, seek his face evermore, remember his marvelous works that he had done, his wonders, and the judgments of his mouth. If anything, I just, you know, I want to talk about his, uh, what he's done, his wondrous works, you know, uh, how marvelous they are, Amen. and the blessings that he's done. And, uh, Song of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 10 and 11, you don't have to turn there, it says, uh, I am my beloved's and his desires toward me. Come, my beloved, let us go forth in the field. Let us lodge in the villages. Let us get up early. Let us see if the vine flourish. And like I said, we've been able to do those things. And uh, just give you kind of an update. That was 2020. Um, Alvin and May are married. Uh, they haven't been able to get to Kalanawan because of COVID-19, but they are going to another place right now and doing the work, so they're busy. Uh, Jessa V., uh, she's married now to the Filipino, grad, one of our graduates who helped me make the video. And they are in Camp Phillips and have started a church there. And uh, Clint is graduated and I'm excited to see what God does with him. Uh, it's something that kind of explains some things like when uh, 
the first couple there, when May mentions uh, she was reached through extension classes, that's one of the ministries that we'll have. It's just like a VBS every Saturday, just go out to different places and villages and, and uh, teach the kids Bible. She was reached through that, and then uh, she got saved, but then her dad died. Her dad died of diabetes type 2, you know, and they, they, you know, they're poor there, and just something as simple as metformin, which could have saved his life, he didn't have, and he died. And she got bitter, but then she got reached again, and then she ended up in teaching in the Christian school, and that's a blessing. Um, so all the different ministries, when I mentioned that, you know, it's like... Uh, you know, what we can do there. And the police station, the police and the military, it's required in the Philippines that they have one hour of moral and spiritual instruction a week. So we can get in there on that. And so we had two different police stations we get to do, and we'd have a devotion, and that was always a blessing. Uh, again, all those got shut down during COVID, and they, as far as I know, they're, I think they just got back into one police station. But uh, they're starting to push the vaccine passport there and different things, so who knows. Uh, and then there's the hospital. You know, we had the hospital maternity ward, you know, the free hospital, the, uh, the state hospital, the maternity ward, you know, they, we had like six, seven different rooms we'd go to, and they'd be about like from here to here from where Pastor Kim is, maybe a little bit bigger, and, you know, they'd have 20 beds in there. And... Uh, women sharing one bed sometimes and with their baby and uh, we'd get to go in there and we'd have uh, we'd sing songs and a young lady would give her testimony and then we'd have a short five minute message and then we got to see some people get saved there uh, one of our graduates who uh, is going to be helping me when I go back, Marlon that's the short version of his name <laughs> yeah. anyway um, yes, Nino I don't want to, I'm not even going to try to say it. <laughs> but he, uh, there was one morning and uh, he went and took a friend to the hospital, the outpatient clinic in the morning at 6 a.m. And they start lining up. Uh, you know, there'll be 60, 70 people lining up at 6 a.m. to try to see a doctor. And he took a friend there and uh, he saw all those people. And Marlon just, you know, he just uh, did what he had been taught, you know, seeing an opportunity to preach the word of God and, saw those people, and he asked the administrator there at the outpatient clinic, can I, can I preach while I'm waiting here? And the administrator at that, he said, yes, you can go ahead and preach. So he preached. And then he got done, and the administrator said, you can do this every day. Amen. Wow. So Marlon called me, and he goes, hey, we can do this every day. Can you help me with this? I said, yeah, sure. So that my flesh didn't want to. I mean, it's 6 a.m. in the morning. You got to get up, you know, five, Ooh, wow. five days a week. And we started doing that, and then we incorporated the... The, the other Bible students, and, you know, we'd rotate with them, pass out tracts, and that went good for about four months. You know, the Lord put on my heart trying to reach Filipino Muslims. I've not got to see Filipino Muslims get saved. But Alvin, that first young man, he grew up in a Muslim area. When he said he wanted to join the Muslim rebels, that's what he was saying and doing. Not because he was a Muslim, but because it was just like something different to do and exciting. But thankfully he didn't, and he ended up getting saved and coming to Bible Institute. Amen. Uh, Clintoy, the, the guy, in the, the, the last young man, he said, I remember, don't know if you remember when he said, I was running from barangay officials. They were chasing him. Well, the thing is, is that he was, they knew he was, he was part of a gang and dealing drugs. I see Duterte, a lot, you know, the liberal media will try to paint Duterte as like he's just sending out hit squads to kill Filipinos that are doing drugs. And, but that's not exactly what he's done. What he's done is that he's uh, told the police that if they get in a battle, they get in a fight, if they kill the drug dealers, don't worry about it. I got your back. And I agree with him on that. But what he's done is he's offered, if they surrender, he offers, he said, we will help you. You know, you don't hear that on the liberal yeah. media. So Clintoy was one of those that surrendered, and he spent a year in juvenile detention, and then they dismissed his case. And then they sent him to the orphanage, the boys' town. And that's where we met him. And the thing is with Clintoy is his father was a Muslim. His father dumped him off on the streets when he was about five years old. I don't know why. But there he is. And he's, he, he's, you know, he fears the word of God. Amen. Now, <laughs> Jessa, the second young lady, 
she was part of that. Sopalco is an electric company. And what they have there is they have a foundation that's from the people that own the electric company to help disadvantaged students. They help them financially and help them with their studies. And the lady that oversees that is part of the church there in Lumbia. And so she made a way for us to go be able to, they have to go there every Saturday if they want to get help. And so she made it so that we can uh, go there and teach them some Bible. Uh, that's another ministry that Marlon helped me get going. I, I didn't tell you, when I was first introduced to it, and Brother Sutek said, if you want this, go ahead. And I was just like, man, I don't know. You know, how do you work with a six-year-old to 18? You know, it's like, how am I going to do that? The Lord put it on my heart to teach him scripture songs. Filipinos love to sing. Yeah. Yeah. And you tell you what, when we were there in 2014, it was Celine Dion in the store. So. <laughs> The, la the young ladies at the cash register, the, stu the guys that were bagging the food, the guys, people that were, they were all singing along with her. Just enough to drive you nuts, man. <laughs> and, you know, it's like they'll have a two-year-old have a birthday party and they'll get a karaoke machine. And it's not for the two-year-old. <laughs> they, they just love to sing. And I thought, well, they love to sing. And the Lord put on my heart to teach them scripture songs. Uh, Mark Rogers scripture songs. And like one that I'll, I'll just, uh, Isaiah 43. Fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God. Hey! That's how he does it. He puts a little Jewish flavor in there. And so I, I was, uh, you know... I'd teach them a scripture song. We'd go, we'd go like five weeks. And I would teach it. I'd preach it. But then it wasn't just me. I'd tell the students, you meditate on this. See what God shows you. And if you get too far out of line, I'll let you know that you're wrong. But th th that wasn't the case. I said, see what God shows you and teach it. And uh, for me, like that verse there, I teach, you know, that's a picture, you know, as Jewish people, it's also a picture of your salvation. You know, the blood of the Lamb on the door. You got saved through Jesus Christ, the blood of the Lamb. You know, baptism is a picture of you identifying in the death, burial, and resurrection. First uh, Corinthians chapter 10, it talks about the baptism of Moses where they went through the Red Sea and da-da-da. And then, and then they crossed the River Jordan, you know, and that's a picture of the Christian going, crossing through those, the great deep, going to heaven. Yeah, Amen. you're going to be fine. The Lord's going to say, come up hither. And then, but then I, I teach this thing where I, the Lord put it on my heart. You can't prove that I'm wrong. I can't prove that I'm right. But I, I get the idea that maybe Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego read that. Isaiah, they had Isaiah, they had Jeremiah. Maybe they read, hey, our fathers went through the Red Sea, they went through the River Jordan. Wow. Who's went through the fire? Wow. <laughs> we'll just see what ha happens. Well, it said, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. The smell of smoke wasn't on them, yeah. the scripture says. And so that's just an idea. And we went through numerous scripture songs. And so by the time we got, within a, a year, you know, I got these, they're able to find Habakkuk, Zephaniah. Amen. They're learning the Bible. They're doing Bible drills. And they're getting, you know, uh, Jesse wasn't the only one that uh, really came along. There's a few others. It's like she said, Jessa said she wanted to go to Bible Institute. She could have went to college and she was thinking about it. Someone said, why not go to Bible Institute? And uh, she wanted her mother to give her her blessing. You have to understand that. You know, for her mother, who the father's absent, living in poverty, you know, when you have a gifted child that's smart and applying themselves, that could be the child that lifts the whole family out of poverty. And her mother didn't want to let her go. She wanted her to go to college. But her mother, you know, she prayed about it. Her mother gave her blessing. Then her mother got saved and her two Amen. sisters. And, and Jessa is, you know, she's, well, she's due to have a baby. She's pregnant. They've been married and Amen. started a church. I'm not going to get to my message. <laughs> you know, I was going to preach on uh, the siege, you know, out of Second Kings chapter 6, out of 7, but I'm not going to go there. I don't have time. But uh, in the Philippines there, because it kind of, you know, we've been de you're, we're dealing with a siege here. Man. You're dealing with it. In the Philippines, it's face masks, shields, contact tracing, temperature checks at the stores. Have to step into, uh, <laughs> have to step you into bleach because the COVID might be on your shoes. Uh, hand sanitizer. You have to drive in subdivisions. They'll have a, a trough there, a little trough with bleach. 
because wow. COVID might be on your tires. Yeah. Oh, uh, you know, oh, wow. and just everywhere. You got to, uh, it was, came to the point where we had to have a, a barangay pass, and they only issued one per family. Wow. My wife doesn't drive there. I drive. I, I like it. I like the challenge, although <laughs> it's crazy. It's, it's good, you know, but, you know, it's not a good idea for me to go to the store and buy groceries. I, I forget about half what I'm supposed to get, and I get all sorts of stuff that I probably shouldn't buy. <laughs> so, anyway, we, we would, I'd just take her, and I'd wait in the car, and it got frustrating. But then we started doing what a lot of the other Filipinos were doing and borrowing barangay passes from neighbors and stuff so we can go out and uh, go shopping. Uh, there was one restaurant that stayed open during the height of it, and that was a Korean restaurant. There's... <laughs> There's a Korean, they had enough room, I guess. Either that or he, he uh, maybe, you know, bribed somebody. I don't know. But I like Korean food. I love kimchi. Amen. My kids love kimchi. Amen. Bless the Lord. Yeah, amen. Come samdida. That's only Korean. Food. But, uh, yeah. So we'd get to go to the Korean restaurant occasionally, and there's a Korean community there, and your, your dad gave me some Korean English tracks I'm going to take back there. And, uh, you know, there's good work to be done there. And, you know, like I said, we had the police station, the hospital, the, the high school. Um, and hopefully we'll get back into there. I don't know what it's going to be like. It's, we, we hope to be back in March 20 next year. Um, I was, you can continue to pray for me. I was diagnosed with cancer. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm glad I'm back here uh, in February. Uh, into February, I was diagnosed with stage three cancer. And so we started dealing with that. I'm now stage two, and I feel pretty good, but I got some checkups to do, and I got to make sure I'm, I'm okay. Um, Lord's been good. Amen, brother. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here. You know, again, that siege mentality. Let's just turn there real quick. I got four minutes. Amen. Just it'll be. I'll just give you the points, and you can check it out yourself. I mean, Second Kings chapter six. You have a siege that comes on the land. Uh, verse twenty-four and twenty-five, and it's a bad famine, and it gets pretty desperate. You know, right before that siege, you have two victories that happened that were significant. Naaman, you know, basically in an Old Testament sense, gets saved and acknowledges one true God. Elisha, you know, there's a great victory. The, the king of Samaria, he's, he's, surrounded, he's, he's done a, he has surrounded them. And, you know, uh, Elisha prays and uh, God takes care of him. You know, Elisha prays that his servant's eyes would be open, that he might see what's going on there, which is encouraging. Because uh, in all this, you know, we're not alone. Just as uh, Elisha and his servant had, had uh, all, of the host, all that host that was there around them, you have with you. you, you have the Lord Jesus Christ. And, Amen. and uh, it's, at times you may think you're outnumbered, but you're not. That's right, Amen. brother. And, uh, you know, I, I mentioned that in the video where it's like it's amazes me that, you know, when you pass out tracks, a million of them, and five, Dr. Sutek, Brother Sutek, he figured it out, and uh, no reason to doubt it. And they get around, you know, people still don't hear it. A lot of times, you know, I, I get the problem where I think even where I'm at or where I'm driving, oh, they don't want this or, you know, they've already heard this. Or, yeah. And I, you can't think that because yeah. there's so many people that haven't heard. That's right. 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 So anyway, in this siege, you know, it gets so bad that, as you know, if you've read your Bible, you have two ladies that they, they make a deal that we're going to cook your baby and then uh -huh. we'll cook my baby the next day. That's pretty bad, you know. So the siege here, the thing we learned is that you've got to be careful about the deception. Like, it's not gonna, there's not going to be any relief. Yeah. And then that deception leads to desperation. Right. Uh -huh. And these two ladies, they, they do something that's desperate. Mm -hmm. You know, the siege gets lifted here shortly. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? That one woman who allowed her baby to be cooked, you know that that food, she couldn't eat. Mm -hmm. I don't think that, you know, there's a verse in Isaiah that says, uh, you know, he feedeth on ashes. A deceived heart hath turned him aside, that he cannot see a lie, lie in his right hand. You know that lady, there was, there was nothing, there was, nothing was going to ever be pleasant again. So you got to, and we're in a siege, and the devil's, he's kicking up his game. 
then you see the delusion of the king, 2 Kings 6, 30 and 31, and he blames Elisha. You know, oh, if I could just kill Elisha. You know, he's like Ahab, Ahab, Ahab you know, who said to Elijah, are you the one that troubleth Israel? No, man, it's you. Yeah, mm -hmm. It's you. And the politicians, so you see the politicians in the seas where they, they, they start to blame Christians. Yeah. And it's, it happened in the Roman Empire. Yes, sir. You know, when there was problems, they blamed the Christians because they wouldn't bow down to the false gods. You know, what do you expect? Psalm 50, verse 16, 17, the last, 17, seeing thou hatest instruction and castest my word behind thee. You've got a country that's done that. The United States has done that yep. for the most part. I'm thankful for the pockets here of Bible-believing Christians that are still doing something for God. And I'm thankful. You know, I think I'm hoping God has some mercy, but, you know, the siege is getting pretty crazy. Then you have the politician, 2 Kings 7, 1 and 2, that he cast doubt on God. Oh, if, yeah, if the windows of heaven would be open, huh? Mm -hmm. and he, but Elisha says, yeah, but you ain't going to see it. But in all that, you see the calmness and assurance that Elisha has. In verse 32, chapter 6, verse 32. He had no doubt, and that's what we have as Christians. You should have the calmness and assurance. We know how it's going to end. You know, uh, through all this, in the Philippines, I say it here, I, say it, I said it there. What we have to do to figure out as Christians is how to navigate through this mess and still be a testimony for Jesus Christ. And be a light in this dark world. Be preaching. That's what we need to do. Amen. Elisha's determination. And then, of course, you see the deliverance. And then you see the leper's decision. The lepers, they say, you know, why sit we here until we die? Yeah, that's the same attitude we should have. We should be out there. We do not well. This is a day of good tidings. We got the answers. I'm going to leave you with this. You know, the idea of passing out tracks. In uh, Eugene, Oregon, I went to go get an oil change, Jiffy Lube, November 10th, and I saw the sign that said, November 11th, Veterans Day, free oil change for veterans. I thought, huh, I'm going to wait till the next day. And I thought, no, nah, everybody's going to be doing that. I'm going to get held up. Anyway, the young man that came up to talk to me about getting the oil change, and I got it. He had a mask on, and I, I said, oh, you don't need that mask. He goes, I have to I might, for my job. I said, Okay. Help yourself. I understand. I said, man, in this craziness of this world, you know how nuts it's getting. You know, you need something good. Here's something that tells you about Jesus Christ. Amen. You can have peace in this crazy world. Yes, sir. That's good. So I got my old change, and then he came up to me to define the final bill, and he goes, you know what? I gave you 10% off for telling me about Jesus Christ. Wow. <laughs> no, that doesn't happen. That shouldn't be your incentive. Wow. <laughs> you know, <what> I mean? <laughs> hopefully I'll get a break. But that was just God showing me that. You know what? He's still with me. I got that calmness and assurance. I should have the same thing Elijah had. Amen.